It was snowing or it just snowed and I was walking across Central Park and it was all pretty, you know, because of the snow. And I didn't, you know, this was before cell phones. I, if I had one, I would have called him and said, it's so great out. But instead, I left him a message on his answering machine of essentially the same thing. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. What, uh, what have you changed your mind about recently? Huh. Uh, I, I actually, I'm, I'm going to vote for Donald. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I've had it with this progressive thing. <laughs> um, Podcast Junkies, episode 82. Welcome back regular listeners and welcome new listeners this is the show where we talk to engaging fantastic fun articulate uh, smart sensible and other cool adjectives uh podcasters who have uh, amazing shows who take pride in their shows and who are personalities that i feel the need to get to know just a little bit better and this podcast gives me the forum to do just that my name is Harry Duran. I'm the host, and every Monday-ish, you can expect to hear a new episode, and uh, it's something that I've been doing for almost two years now. April 2014 was the first episode, and it's been a heck of a ride ever since. I'm looking forward to celebrating 100, haven't decided what we're going to be doing yet, but uh, something cool, I imagine. Uh, this week, we speak to Michael Shaw. He's the host of the uh, Art Conversation podcast. And uh, we met uh, through some work that I was helping uh, Michael with on his show. And um, we happened to also meet up in person at a, at a meetup here in Los Angeles. And uh, we just got to talking and uh, he's been podcasting for going on four plus years and I just thought it was a good idea to have a conversation with him because I, I like to pick the brains of people who've been doing it for a while and they all have different perspectives. And um, I thought his subject matter was really interesting. So um, um, I think you'll you'll get a lot out of it. It's a, it's a nice conversation. Uh, speaking of nice, long conversations, last week we spoke to Ibario Nex Perejo. I don't get tired of saying that, it's a cool name. <laughs> He's uh, the host of the Candid Frame, and um, that was that went an hour and a half, but uh, chock chock full of really really good insights. So uh, definitely check that out. Um, he's been doing it ten plus years, and you can imagine he's got some OG podcasting science to drop left and right. So uh, check that out. So um, stay tuned to the end of the episode where I, I drop the retention hashtag. It's a, it's a little thing I do with my regular listeners to figure out if they're listening all the way to the end. And uh, I'll give you the details for our sponsor, which is Fancy Hands. They've graciously given us a couple of um, special codes that will give you five free tasks to use as you will, as you'd like on the um, on the service. So if you're wondering what Fancy Hands is, um, it's a request that can be completed in about 20 minutes uh, and, uh, online. And they, what they do is they, they take a request from you on the site. And it's fantastic because you can actually log in via the website, via an amazing app. You can send them a text message. You can email your request. And a standard request will be answered within 24 hours. Ideally, it's for tasks that requ require a response from a third party, coordinating back and forth. Uh, but they'll they'll try to tackle all types of, of uh, requests. So definitely uh, give it a shot. Um, some of the things that people use it for are recurring appointments, research you need done for a weekly meeting with your boss. Um, another example is when you really need to get a reservation or restaurant reservation and you need to call back every day to see if there's a cancellation. I've used it for a variety of things such as finding a, uh, a veterinarian in my neighborhood that was open on the weekends and I had them ask what type of insurance they, they accepted. I've had, I've taken pictures of catalogs that were piling up that I just didn't want to be, didn't want to receive anymore. I took like five pictures, I zipped it up, sent it to them. And by hook or by crook, they were able to get me um, off of those mailing lists, which is fantastic. 
One of the best uses is when I need to get on the phone with someone at the cable company or the phone or mobile phone company like Verizon, but I, I know just from previous experience, it's going to be like an hour wait. There's no better feeling than to have them call you back at your time, that's at a time that's better for you or just where you can be waiting on the phone. And they call you and say, hey, Harry, it's is your assistant here. I'm connecting you with the Verizon rep and you just get on the phone. I can't tell you how much time that saves you. So there's a ton of different uh, ideas on the site on how you could use it, common requests. I encourage you to check it out if it's something you're interested in. Then the only thing you need to do is leave a, a review. And if you haven't left one in a while, you can leave a new one. And just put Fancy Hands as the hashtag in the review on iTunes or on Stitcher if you're an Android user. And I'll be looking for out, out for those uh, every week. And then um, as I compile them once a month, I'll pick a name out of a hat and I'll give you the code for your five free tasks. Check it out. It's been a lifesaver for me. I think I've been doing it now with them for over three years, and I and obviously I can't say enough good things about them. So enough about my productivity methods. Let's learn a little bit more about uh, Michael Shaw and his podcast. Enjoy. So Michael Shaw, thank you so much for joining. Very grand. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on Podcast Junkies. You bet. Thank you for having me. We had an interesting uh, setup process getting to, this, <laughs> getting to this point in the conversation. Does that not ever happen with any of your other guests? Um, yeah, it's funny because I, I have the benefit of talking to podcasters. So for the most part, the majority of them have a, a setup because they interview um, other, other guests on their show. So they're either accustomed to or, or have the equipment in-house. Um, so nine times out of 10, it's not like... You know, people you must talk to on a regular basis who probably don't have a professional mic. In See, there. I wanted to be them. So I was making you do all the work. I'm like, I'm taking a break. I don't, I'm not lugging my equipment around. <laughs> what, what, what type of equipment do you normally record with? I have a um, Mackie mixer that's a, a USB mixer. You know, everything's geared to be USB, and, and that originated from... <clears throat> the desire, the need to be portable, basically. So there's the Mackie mixer, there are mic, mic stands, and the mics are Sure 57, which I know is not high end, it's kind of medium end. I don't know if you'd even describe it as lower than medium end, but they basically worked fine. And um, uh, yeah, and what else? You know, and then just the laptop. The 57 is a, is a workhorse, though. I, I think it's an industry standard in, in like music for... Mm -hmm. for, with like bands and stuff like that because you, yeah, you can drop it and nothing will happen to it. Right, yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's hauled a lot, around a lot and I, you know, when it, I saw the reviews, they seemed fine. So, and it's turned out to be good. I know that, I think, is it the Sure 58 or 59 or something that's $400 a mic and I was just, you know, why spend that much for one mic when I can get four for the same amount, you know? So how long ago did you buy this equipment and how much research did you have to do at the time? Great question. I, I bought them. I did a Kickstarter. I've done one Kickstarter for the show. That was back in 2013, I believe. And um, so that was once I got the funds, that's when I started doing the research and spending. So I was looking at mics. I was looking actually right around the time that I set up the Kickstarter because then I knew how much I wanted to have as a minimum. So I looked at the mics, the mixer, and so on, and then that all kind of um, uh, became resolved, you know, at some point after the Kickstarter, and you know, got it in the mail, and that was it. I was ready to go. When when did you launch uh, episode one? Episode one was launched. Well, here's the thing: you're, you're going to love this. The launch date of the show officially was eleven, eleven, eleven. Nice. So November 11, 2011. Which is my wife's um, birthday. Whose? My wife's birthday. <laughs> oh, wow. Happy birthday. Wow. Okay. That's exciting. That's an awesome day to have as a birthday. Um, and mine is 10-10. 10-10. Nice. <laughs> okay. So that's why you guys are so synchronous, huh? Yeah. Um, so the, um, the process was that I did my first podcast actually with the guy, Jeff Tuck, who... 
allowed me to launch the podcast on his blog, which is called Notes on Looking. It's an art blog that has been taken over since by another guy. But uh, I basically teamed up with him. I wanted to have a platform that already had a little bit of, bit of traffic, you know, instead of just launching it out, in, out into space with nothing. So we actually recorded our first episode all the way back in July together with a woman who was Barry Zipperstein. Barry Zipperstein was our first guest. And subsequently, I recorded on my own. I did, I think, five more. And then so I launched the first six on that 1111. And how much did you know about what you were getting into in, t in terms of uh, all the, the pieces that you had to have in place for getting a podcast episode recorded? Well, if I were to ask you that question, you would probably say not very much. But <laughs> I, I think it was all pretty gradual, honestly. Um, I think it was, you know, baby steps. And, you know, I, I want to sort of have a platform, an audience, as it were, in place before I, before I put it out there, you know? I'm not going to just, I think I was aware enough to know that if I just recorded myself and put it out there that nobody would listen. So I was like, what do I need to do, you know? And that's why the investing in Note Jeff and Notes, Notes on Looking was an important first step. Um, and I do remember, by the way, that all that said, that the first you know, a few episodes were, you know, barely hitting, if not not hitting the uh, the triple digits. So, you know, I certainly remember back to that phase. Um, but it was, yeah, I think it was gradual. You know, so first I need to see if I can do it on this snowball mic, and then you know what sound program am I going to use, and then you know how am I going to get guests? Mm. You know, those are the main questions. Are you? is like using this type of equipment and working with this type of technology was the podcast the first time you tackled a project like this or, or is there other stuff that you've done in the past where you've had to kind of cobble together technology and, and learn new stuff? I, I wish I could say the latter, but I think it is more of the former. Um, I'm not a, what's the word? I'm not a uh, autodidact by any stretch of the imagination. Um, like many of us, I want a handyman, you know, when it comes to <laughs> challenging technical hurdles. Um, I had, I should say, I had done a little bit of radio. That was actually um, part of the reason I started the podcast, you know, because I, I had that interest in some of that background, but not a lot in the way of the technical side. I mean, I had done a little bit of editing and a little bit of recording. But as far as, you know, what equipment I'm going to use for myself, um, you know, I was pretty, I was basically asking around a lot. You know, I asked the guy at Santa Monica College where I took a couple of classes, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And there was, you know, there wasn't a lot of consensus. So I had to sort of, you know, go with that combined with maybe what my, my budget was. So... What uh, were there other types of shows that you were thinking of starting, or did you know from the get go that you were going to do an art podcast? Yes, the latter, <laughs> because I, I but see the reason I hesitate is because I I still would like and I'm still open to doing another kind of podcast, like where I have some kind of partner or partners. You know what I mean? Something that's a little more mainstream. One of the biggest challenges of working in this niche is that it's a very small niche. You know. But yes, I mean, the, the, the genesis was that I had a little bit of experience in radio and I was an artist and I was getting very interested in podcasts and I knew that I could not fit my needs in radio, right? So I was combining podcasting on one hand with uh, art on the other hand. I mean, for me to start somewhere outside of that expertise would have been, I think, you know, pretty disastrous. So, yeah. Uh, how would you describe that is, cause you said it's niche. How would you describe the type of artists that you bring onto the show? Well, first of all, they're not only artists. Okay. So here was, so here was the, the, here's the short version of the evolution of the show. Originally it was actually called the conversation Unartist podcast. 
maybe I was worried about, you know, sh- getting too close to other names. I was obviously didn't need to be that <laughs> elaborate. But the original, uh, the original theory was that it was only artists, fuck everybody else in the art world, right? Only artists. And then a dealer, <laughs> p- 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 appropriately enough, uh, who I had a conversation with about the show said, you know, why don't you open up, you know, to collectors, you know, dealers, writers. And indeed, at some point, I did start doing that. In fact, that was absolutely necessary. Not only was it a good idea, it was a necessary idea. And in fact, many of the best episodes of the show have been with writers. So, but to go back to your question, if, if you know, if, from that detour, um, there are two ways I can answer it. One is that simply, like, leads you know, was the way that I got artists. And that's sort of the short version of how it was in the beginning. And now it's who's going to be a good conversation, you know? In fact, to the point of it's not necessarily even that important how good their work is, almost, almost, you know? I mean, it's like if I have a choice of a great artist with a big name who's a really shitty conversation or a mediocre artist who's a great conversationalist i'm going to go with the latter so how do you know that going into your interview how do you know you know obviously if you have if you've got someone who you think is a great artist is there anything that you can do beforehand to find out what type of conversationalist they're going to be i do the screening call okay so yeah talk, yeah do you okay. do the screening call i don't talk talk about why that's important it's essential because we there are two essentially two parts. One is to find out, you know, if they're going to be okay, you know, if they're if they're if there's hope, if there's potential. And two, what are we going to talk about? You know, I mean, I know that you can, you know, we have a natural platform because you know I'm a podcaster. You can ask me about podcasting. If somebody is an artist, I can't just ask them about their work. See, that's the challenge. Originally. We talk shop or, we, you know, it was kind of like a studio visit. You know, when you do a studio visit with an artist, it's like, oh, you know, you, I really like this one. Or oh, how did you do that? You know what I mean? This is an audio medium <laughs> with a visual content, right? So the way around that, ultimately, it wasn't like this in the beginning, is what are we going to talk about? You know, so there are two sort of sides to that. One is we talk about your story and how you got to where you are. The other side to that is we talk about anecdotes that are tangential to your work. But if we talk about your work, which is, a, you know, for the most part, a visual medium, there are exceptions like with writers, obviously, and that's why writers tend to be so good, you know, because writing is you're talking about things rather than you're making things. And so, in any case, I'm kind of losing my train of thought, and then you're probably getting bored, so... You got the gist of it. <laughs> no, not at all. I think um, and anything that we as podcasters can learn, because as as many podcasters as there are out there, there's that many ways of tackling how they handle. You know, for those of us that do do interviews, you know, that that the their approach. Because, like I said, I don't do pre interviews, but my pre interview, so to speak, is having known the person that I'm going to bring on the show. I don't bring anyone on cold. Right, and I ha- had some type of interaction with them, and and more likely than not, have met them in person or just had in, been engaging with them online for a specific period of time. So, it's almost in a way my pre-interview because I know what I'm getting into when when, right. they, when they come onto the show. Um, has there been, without getting in, into specifics of people, has has there been folks that you've got on the phone with in a pre-interview and you knew pretty quickly that that's that either they weren't a fit or their content wasn't a fit or they were just not going to be good for the show? I think there have only been a couple, actually. Only one of them comes to mind. Um, I'm sure there was at least one more than that. But yes, there was a conversation, phone conversation, <clears throat> and it was actually with a guest. By the way, just to give you a little more context about this, I originally started doing only in-person conversations. And that was the way it was for the first couple years. Um, and then I started doing phone conversations and now it's more phone conversations than in person. But this was going to be a guest who would be local to Los Angeles and and in person. And I think we're both actually 
we didn't say, I should say, we didn't say this isn't going to work at the end of the call, but there was a real flatness to the end of the conversation. Um, like we had kind of missed our signals and connections along the way. And so this guest, potential guest did not follow up with me and I did not follow up with this potential guest. And I think we're both cool with that. <clears throat> yeah. You just let it, uh, uh, peter out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I didn't respond with an email and she did not respond with an email and, uh, yeah. And so there was no, I, I, I don't think she lost sleep over not coming on the show, but I'm not sure. Um, have, do you purpose purposely go out of your way to try to have conversations with people whose work you respect? Not necessarily, actually. That's, that's a really, it's an interesting question because, well, here, let me put it this way, first of all. This is the sort of most sensational answer, okay? I sort of fantasize, that's maybe too strong a word, but I, I, I envisioned for a long time if I could get X artist, who's kind of a superstar on the show, a, local, a Los Angeles artist, you know, and once I did there would be such a fervor to listen to that episode that I could put it behind a paywall, right? Not only was that ill-advised, and, and it never happened, by the way, because this guest, um, or this potential guest, I should say, did not. Uh, I was in touch with this guest studio manager. Do you know about these, the Los Angeles studio? Do you know about the studios of big artists, Harry? No, uh, talk a little bit about that. Okay, so sure. So there are certain big-time artists. There are... Probably there could be a dozen of them, but certainly a handful will come to mind to many. And these people have studios. So it is it's John Doe studio, you know, and that means that this artist has a staff of anywhere from three people on the very low end to like 12 to 15 or more on the high end. So. So in this case, with this particular artist I'm referring to, I, I had a, an email exchange with their studio manager, you know, the person who does kind of a little bit of everything, right, as opposed to the people who do assisting, production, et cetera. And the last I remember hearing from her, she said that they were going to be having a meeting coming up soon and it would be raised as a topic. But I never heard anything further than that. Now, all that to say that in retrospect, I have no regrets about that because I think this superstar would have not would not have made a very good guest. So, to answer your question, finally, um, it's nice to respect the art, but sometimes it's better, and oftentimes it's better to respect the guest more than the art to make a good podcast. Yeah, and I think as we we all go through that as new podcasters, I remember thinking about you know trying to line up my a guests early on in the, in the in the life of a of my show so i could you know obviously get thousands of downloads right. <laughs> and everyone would hear about the show right um a, a friend of mine um they they wrote a book uh jared easley and, and kamanzi um it call, it's called stop, it's actually called stop chasing influencers and the whole point is like get out of this mindset of having these one or two anchor guests that are, that are somehow magically going to transform your show. And right. I, and I think you've probably discovered uh, over the years that it's really just a matter of playing the long game, having conversations with people that you want to speak to. And then your, your, your listeners are going to be attracted to it because they're going to hear the dynamic of you having an engaging conversation with someone who wants to speak to you as, as opposed to someone who's probably right. bo bored with the idea of being on your show. Or yeah, or or maybe it's like I'm. They're doing me a huge favor by yeah. coming on. So did Harry? Did you en end up landing any of those dream guests? I, I've had fantastic high-profile guests. I had. Uh, I mean, I've as the listeners know, I've I've, I've had uh, Mark Marin's executive producer Brendan McDonald. Um, wow, well, how was that? It was fantastic. He, it was a Skype call, and um, he. I just I connected through Twitter. And uh -huh. it, it, sometimes you don't know unless you ask, and you just I reached out, and he said yes, and we right. had to finally make some time uh, that worked happen. And I interviewed uh, Leah Tao of the podcast uh, Strangers, and she mm. actually lives here in LA, so that was one of my first in-person interviews. So wow. I, I recorded the whole moment of me walking. I got some exterior sound of me 
stepping crunching on the gravel as I walked over. So right. I made some pretty good use of like the the, the sound effects. Uh, nice. And it was nice. It was it was a lot of fun. I was definitely nervous. Um, and just you know, I just try. I'm I'm gonna go after a couple of bigger names, Roman Mars and uh, mm. other folks like that in in the podcasting space. But I think. I think it, what's more important for me is to have engaging conversations with people who are passionate about podcasting in general. And, and I love the fact that I have a, a a broad range of people to speak to, whether it's a podcast about business, art, right. music, um, you know, storytellers or, or sports or anything like that. So that, that's, what was that woman's name? Leah? Did Le- you say? Yeah. Leah Tao. Leah? T- yeah. So who are you more nervous to talk to Leah or Brandon McDonald? Um, Either one for, for, for different reasons, but I, right. yeah. So, so uh, I'm, before we leave the subject of Brendan McDonald, I am perpetually looking for my own Brendan McDonald. So if anybody listening is an aspiring producer, sorry for the plug, but you know. No, I, not at all. <laughs> um, when, you, when you say, you mean aspiring producer in any genre? Podcast. Oh, oh, in any genre. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm open to somebody that's a producer, a podcast producer coming from business, but is open to working on an art podcast. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. So in your mind, that falls under the, the, over, the, the general umbrella of the, the concept that you have about with, with the show, like a, a, a conversation about art? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know if we're crossing lines here, but basically I'm saying... If I find a producer to produce my show the way that Brendan McDonald oh, okay. produces his show, that's what I'm talking about. Gotcha. So I don't really care if they know anything about art as long as they can get things done. Got it. Great. No, I, thought, I, I, mean, I, thought, I, thought, I thought for a minute you wanted Brendan McDonald as a guest on your show, like oh, someone like that. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, that's where we cross lines. Yeah. Actually, I mean, I wouldn't mind having him, but I mean, I, I'm not sure that would make a lot of sense. So where's this... I'll call it a need for now and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this need for you to have these types of long in-depth and sometimes personal and candid conversations with uh, folks you barely know. Well, you're, you're, you actually mentioned that you listened to the Jennifer Sullivan episode, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. So, and for people listening, this is the, actually the current episode that came out a week and a half ago um, with a, it, Jennifer Sullivan is a, Brooklyn based, I'm sorry, a Queens, New York based artist. And she, she was very courageous in sharing her dating life, the fact that she's an analysis, things like this. I mean, let's be honest. And I, and I, I don't want to give him any more attention than he already has because he has way too much of it as it is. But certainly Mark Maron and WTF, you know, that's kind of the paradigm for, you know, exposing yourself as it were or honest conversations and i was in, honestly i was inspired by that show to a large extent to start my own so I, I mean i need to give him credit for that what is hard is that you know that show has become so oversaturated in the podcast world that i think your listeners i would imagine are pretty tired maybe of talking or hearing about it but as that is where i was in, largely where i was inspired and that format was kind of what inspired me originally. And obviously it was a, a style that I needed to eventually get away from instead of just being an imitator. But I think another podcast that I really love is the mental illness happy hour, you know, and that is a very different format in, in a sense. And it is also extremely personal, you know? Um, I think for me, it's, it's finding the right balance between being really personal and being constructive when it comes to something having to do with art. The great thing about Jennifer Sullivan, as you know, is that she also does comedy, she stand up comedy. And so that was a really nice platform into talking about fears and, you know, uh, ambitions and, you know, doing something that was not visual. Where did your skill as an interviewer come from? I think it's uh, being a question asker. You know, I, I recognize actually, do you recognize, do you, can you look back retrospectively and go, oh yeah, I, I really did like to ask questions when I was young or yeah, as a younger adult or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Do you look back at yourself that way? Uh, sometimes. I'll tell you why I asked that question, because 
when I lived in New York City, I had a neighbor, my, my neighbor across the hall, actually, and we, he, we became very good friends. And, but I do remember many conversations with him where he was a little on the slow side for my taste than for a New Yorker. And I remember several conversations we had where I would be on to the next question, you know, and he reacted in such a way without actually saying it as if to say, whoa, slow down, you know? So I just, you know, I want to like, boom, 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 you know? And I, of course you recognize after doing it a while, you know, you have to tailor your question pace and your pace in general to your guest, you know? But yeah, I mean, I think, Originally, it started from being a question asker, and I guess beyond that, it's just doing you know doing this for a few years. Is there uh, if you if I were to ask your parents if this is something that this probably because a question asker by nature is is curious. So is that an aspect of your personality that that, that was inherent in you as you were growing up? Not really. Um, it's interesting because this this idea, this concept of curiosity, like somebody actually said to me recently, people who are curious must make really good guests, you know, because they're curious about the world and they have a lot to say. And, um, you know, the way they think about things is really interesting. And that may very well be true. Um, sometimes it's as much about process. I don't know if this is going to come off as kind of weird, but... Sometimes it's as much about process as about curiosity. You know what I mean? In other words, um, to be more specific, I think one of the greatest things about, one of the greatest moments in a podcast conversation for me is when we're really in the moment together, which I know sounds maybe a little bit like a bit cliched, but I don't necessarily want to find out anything in particular about a given guest, if, if you know what I'm saying so much as I want to have a moment of connection. So whatever that vehicle of connection is, whether it's because I, was, I got really curious about a certain thing or whether it was maybe because we bonded over a certain thing or philosophy or what have you, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily matter in the long run. Why is that uh, moment of connection important for you? I guess it's, I mean, sex comes to mind. I mean, I, uh, maybe that's a bit of a charge analogy, but certainly we can probably all say about sex that when you're in it, you know, at least in the, in, in the better moments of sex that, you know, you're not thinking about anything else. <laughs> Harry is smiling right now, everybody. And, um, <laughs> appropriately enough. Uh, and, and I guess that's kind of the same thing the, actually that is it with the podcast because, and I'm going to ask you this too, because there's so many moments when you're talking to somebody where you're thinking about the next question, where you're thinking this is going really badly, where you're thinking, um, we're going to have to wrap it up soon. You know what I mean? So when you're not thinking at, about any of those things, you know, that's a really good thing. And it's not as easy as it sounds. What about you? Do you, you know, uh, strive to achieve that? Or what is your version of striving to achieve that? to avoid, you know, those thoughts of like, oh, where am I? Just engagement. Uh, just uh, focus on every single word that the guest is saying. Mm. Like, that's just, does that get exhausting for you? No, because it's, this is not a four-hour conversation. It's just, <laughs> right. I only got to do it for an hour. So if I, if I can't focus for an hour, then maybe I right. shouldn't be a podcaster. <laughs> right, right, right. And to be quite honest, if I'm trying to get the best experience you know, out of our interaction together with the understanding that the majority of these go through as a straight shot. I'm not going to try to edit it to make it sound as NPR perfect as it has to be. Um, I think mm -hmm. it behooves me to pay, you know, just to hang on every word that you're saying to, to see where there's opportunities to dig in. And I put myself in the listener's shoes because I want to, you've probably heard interviews as well where you, you hear the, uh, the host asks the guest a question, um, and then they give an answer, and then and then they go on to the next question. But there's something in there that they answered that, as a listener, you're like, wait, don't leave that open thread there. Ask them about that one point. And sometimes a host, some of the, some hosts are so fixated on getting through their set of questions that they just skip over like, 
going down some rabbit hole or pulling apart some thread that uh, the average listener would probably pick up on. You're actually, what you just described is a really great illustration of why, and you mentioned this word several times earlier, interview. It's a word that actually, and I know that's really kind of the, the Webster definition of what we're doing to an, an extent, but the problem I have with that word is it, it's really, for me, becomes so affiliated with question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, just what you were talking about, you know. You have your questions, you know, and it is an NPR kind of thing for the, oftentimes, you know, and then you fulfilled that question and you have your next question. And what I want is to have a conversation. And that's what I want it to be called. People, you know, who are guests who I'm just starting to meet and like do the screening call and set up a, a podcast with will use that word. And, you know, I don't want to alienate them. So I won't say, no, it's a conversation. But that's what I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, because I don't want them to, them to conflate the interview that you described with the conversation that we are trying to have. Good point. Um, and I think it's an acquired skill because I know in the beginning, it's definitely I had my questions and I that's all I right. had as my foundation and, right. and something to hold on to right. when you're just getting started. So I think, you know, I, uh, we all learn as we get, hopefully get better. As we, as we go along. Do you think there was a, was a gradual, do you think, for you? Or do you think there was actually an episode where you're like, I don't need my questions, I'm good? There was one, I think, um, one came to mind, uh, episode six, I had it with uh, John Lee Dumas, who's a, is a big podcaster. And he only has, he gives people half an hour. He's so busy. like, mm. um, And so I literally, I had the list and I was like, you know what? I mean, we're probably at like 20, 25 minutes here. So I just talked about whatever was on my mind. It was a pretty freeing moment. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I, I have more fun when the conversations are like that. And so for the most part, I, I kind of do a little bit of homework. Um, I listen to some of the episodes to get a feel for what the show is about. And then mm. like any good conversation, man, you don't go into a bar with your friend with five questions you want to ask your best friend about how his right. week, weekend was, right? <laughs> right. So, you know, it's and if most people are have the ability to, to engage in a, in a conversation. And, and this is good because, you know, we, we're focused on trying to get the best out of each other, hopefully, and, and we're not staring at our phones. And, you know, it's, it's so rare nowadays to be able to engage with someone for this specific, you know, period of time. Um, everywhere you go, you don't have to go too far to find people, even at dinner, husband and wife, just both looking at their phones at the table. Are you, is that you and your wife have been guilty of? No, I, I obviously at some point, you know, we, we get into a rabbit hole like, oh, they bring up something that reminds you, oh, I got to show you about this uh, link that reminded me of something. And then you just right. <laughs> you just look at the phone and before you know it, you're like, oh, what's this address? You look at an address and you know how the phones are. It's like now they're everything's on there. So you're, you're one swipe away from being on Facebook and being in your email and being in Google Maps. And it's just... It just never ends. So you have to have some sort of discipline for that sort of stuff. So I try to like go in and I put my phone face down. So I, I don't even see an alert or a right. light or anything else to bother me like that. Well, I just for the record, I'm not one of those people actually. I do have a smartphone, so I'm not a total Luddite, but I only use it for texting, Instagram, uh, like one game. Yeah. And occasionally I'll go online, like if I need to look something up. You yeah. know, because I'm yeah. remote, but I, I don't do the Facebook. I don't do the email on the phone. I mean, that's just where I, you know, it would feel kind of like, ha you know, it's like the, having your phone next to your bed, you yeah. know, which is just, that's just, you got to draw the line there. So uh, switching gears for a little bit, how would you describe yourself uh, in terms of an artist? Ooh, that's a big question. Uh, well, I would say that I'm an artist who has moved around a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and that's to a fault, I think, because, you know, in art for, for people listening who are not, you know, particularly tuned into art, uh, people build brands, you know, the way that they do in, you know, in other fields. And the, the quickest way to build a brand is to essentially start doing the same thing as early as possible and keep doing it for as long as possible. So on 
the other side of the spectrum, I have moved around a lot. Um, but I am doing, I have been doing, working with a medium called Cyanotype for the last couple of years. And I've tried to stay, you know, pretty close to a uh, set of constraints conceptually and stylistically. But, you know, there's plenty of variation within that. So for those who don't know what Cyanotype is, can you describe it? Sure, sure. So f- photography started with a lot of different iterations. And one of the early iterations was cyanotype. And people might recognize this if I describe it's a cyan. So it's like a form of blue spectrum. And you may have seen a silhouette like print with things like leaves and pine cones and twigs and things like that. You know, it's very, it's like a classic art project for uh, like a workshop or, you know, an extracurricular, you know, kind of class. So that's basically, that's, that's the gestalt of, of cyanotype. I use it in a very different way. But so basically, it's um, you make a, uh, a mask, you know, in the case that I described with, you know, twigs and, and, um, and pine cones, and then you expose it. You can either expose it with UV ray bulbs or the sun, which is a, you know, a form of UV. And then you develop it. And um, so it's basically a, an alternate form of photography that's actually a lot less expensive and has kind of limits, but also possibilities. How, how, did, how does someone come across or how does someone become a, a cyanotype artist? Like what's the progression? <laughs> what's the progression? Like where, where do you start? And it's how- actually become surprisingly popular in the last few years or kind of in a revivalist sense. Um, I wouldn't call myself a cyanotype artist. Um, because I think, and I think most people who use cyanotypes in, in the serious art world wouldn't describe them themselves that way because it's, it's a bit, um, limiting and it sounds kind of a little bit ghettoizing, but that said, uh, I actually, my studio mate, my former studio mate, um, was paying close attention to what I was doing a couple of years ago, which was airbrush silhouette type things. And he said, you should try cyanotypes because it's basically doing a similar sort of, process but using the sun instead of paint essentially Hmm. so that's how kind of how i came to it um but basically you know you can one can use cyanotypes as one part of the art that they make that they don't necessarily become i mean i i guess i'm kind of a ghettoizer myself but um i basically describe myself as making cyanotypes on canvas so they're kind of like alternative paintings are there famous cyanotype artists? No, actually, I don't think there are. I mean, there are famous artists who have used cyanotypes, but there are not famous cyanotype artists. Would you describe it as a lucrative field? That <laughs> <laughs> um, I back away from? <laughs> um, no, uh, I mean, I think there's potential there. I, I know that one artist who shows at a big gallery here in Los Angeles, uh, had a, at a show that had a, a couple, two to three, had three different processes slash elements. And one of those was this wall of cyanotypes on can on linen stretched over stretcher bars and it covered a wall. Um, and I think that artist has moved on from cyanotypes that he's not, I don't think he's using them anymore, but I think he could be described as somebody who has a lucrative career <laughs> for what it's worth. Yeah. Um, how important is it for you to have this, this outlet for you as an artist? Because I imagine you're wearing many hats at this point now, you're an artist, you're a podcaster. Um, right. And there may be other hats you're wearing as well. So how important is it to have the art as your anchor? It's a really interesting question, I think, because I'm not, I can't even categorize or, or sort of uh, um, measure, you know, how important it is um, and how much of an anchor it is. I think on one hand, it kind of, I, I suppose, I, at least I've thought of it this way, it gives me some street cred in terms of doing this show. Like, in other words, 
if you said a writer was doing a podcast, in fact, there is a writer doing an artist podcast, by the way, but if you said a writer was doing a podcast or a curator or, or a gallerist was doing a podcast, it would have a very different feel to it than an artist doing a podcast. So I think that's really a short answer to your question. Um, as far as anchoring, I mean, I wonder if one, if wonder, I wonder if I could say that the podcast is anchoring my art, you know, in some ways mm. you could say that because the fact that I started doing the podcast and that it kind of gave me <clears throat> a new life of sorts or a different or an extended life, um, means that, uh, I can maybe bring a certain new energy to my art. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you could put it a number of different ways, but um, it, it's definitely an important anchor. Have you had conversations with guests and when the conversation was done, they've inspired you to do something different with your personal art? Good question. Um, huh. I think the answer is yes, but not in a way that I can remember right at this moment. Um, I think it's cumulative. You know, I think all of the different insights and philosophies, I, I'm going to answer, I'm going to switch gears and answer that question in a different way by saying there was a period like in the first third of doing the show in which I was meeting with a lot of really successful artists and doing podcasts with them and feeling really shitty about myself in the process. Um, so I think one answer to your question is, yeah, it made me like think, what the fuck am I doing? You know, or how can I compete with that? And so on and so forth. Now I've managed to filter out that those kinds of voices a lot better. Um, so I think it's as much about navigating the sort of emotional roller coaster of being an artist and being in communication with these people as it is being inspired by what they do, the way they think about being an artist, the way they think about their ideas and so on. So we've, we've had discussions in the past about the challenges of getting an audience to your podcast, which I imagine in some way mirrors the challenges with getting an audience to your artwork. <laughs> and uh, talk a little bit about the, the, those challenges and, and, and how you've managed them over the, the, you know, the, the four going on four years now, four plus years of doing this and, and what your thoughts about, if you had any thoughts about possibly monetizing and, and what, what that looks like now in its present form. Right. <clears throat> it's real. I got to say, first of all, it's, it's really, if you're not a superstar right now, I, I don't know if this is going to come across as analogous to podcasters, but if you're not a superstar artist right now, it's really challenging because the, you know, it's going to sound like a lot of industries, but there are so many artists out there. Los Angeles is bringing, you know, is having this boom of galleries, but it doesn't matter. There's still too many artists, you know, for these galleries to fill all of those artists needs. So, I, I don't know if I'm getting off track and answering your question about the artist part, but um, I think certainly one answer is they they feed each other. You know, doing the podcast feeds my art audience, and and um, I don't know how much the other way around. Actually, come to think of it, but I certainly like having the opportunity to be known as an artist and not as a podcaster in some cases, and people find that out maybe later, if at all. Um, but I think really the big question or the big answer to your question is it's a steady grow and um, w for the lack of having that special guest that all of a sudden is going to, you know, burst me into the stratosphere, I still hold out hope that there will be something that breaks the show, you know, and when I say break, I mean it in the sense of the documentary the year punk broke you know about nirvana um you know it's like something i keep feeling like there just needs to be one thing you know whether it's some kind of publicity thing or what have you that breaks the show into a new audience level you know i think maybe i'm deluding myself too but um 
but in the meantime, I, I recognize that the growth is, is steady. Um, sometimes it does feel like it's stagnating though. So remind me of what your question was again. <laughs> no, it's interesting to see the way that you, you choose to answer in terms of what resonates with you right now. And, and, you know, obviously you're no different than any other podcaster who's been doing this for, you know, once they start going past the first year, the second year, they realize that it is slow and steady wins the race, right? Because you're going to have ups, you're going to have downs. And I think if you can measure success over the past six months as better than the previous six months, then you know you're headed in the right direction. But I don't think there's a there's a silver bullet or a, right. a, 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 a you know a, a hail mary guest that's going to come in and just kind of take things out. And I, I think um, the fact if you have a commitment to producing a quality show week in and week out, I think people gravitate towards that. And I and then I've seen you know you um, people that have made comments to your show. There's people that have donated to your show as well. So can you talk a little bit about those? loyal fans, if you will, who've been following you over the years and, and how important those are? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, <clears throat> thank you for bringing them up. I should even give some shout outs, I feel like, but I, I realize that, um, it's really hard. I recognize how hard it is to donate to a podcast because I have a hard time doing it myself. Um, and so I know, I know I'm being a little hypocritical, you know, when I sort of, uh, either subtly or maybe less than subtly, um, uh, what's the word provoke, not provoke, uh, manipulate guests, hmm. uh, sorry, manipulate listeners into maybe p potentially giving. I mean, I, I honestly don't get that hardcore very often. I've probably just done it a couple times, but yeah, I mean, there's a, it's a very small group and, there have been a few people that have donated from relatively large amounts of money, you know, emphasis on relative, but still, um, these people I'm, I'm very, very grateful to. Um, and I, I feel like in some ways I can't even pay them back. Uh, and then there are people that's also a very small number who engage, uh, a guy named David Rufo, who I'll give a, a shout out to is somebody that reached out to me. He's in upstate New York. Um, working on a PhD and he is somebody that's been posting on Facebook, you know, saying, listening to episode with so-and-so, you know, while I'm painting this picture, mm. you know, and that's just really nice. I mean, it's really nice that he's taking the time to, um, give back, you know, sort of his love of the show to other people. Um, you know, and then there are other people that just regularly through social media, occasionally there are some people through email that just say, you know, I really like what you're doing. You know, I had the opportunity last week. I went to UNLV, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where I did a presentation on behalf of the podcast. And I met a woman who's in the MFA program who um, really liked the show. She has not donated, by the way. No <laughs> pressure. But she, she, you know, she apologized for that. And I can totally empathize, but she, you know, she was really, really appreciative of what I do, you know, and on one hand, you know, let's be honest, I think we as podcasters who have a certain number of listeners get maybe a little bit jaded about that kind of love, but at the same time, another part of us is just really trying to hold on to how grateful we are, you know, because if we didn't have it, we would know so, so quickly how much we miss it. Yeah, I, I definitely think we can't take those listeners and the listeners who engage with us for granted because they are the um, the lifeblood of any podcast. Because when you start, you have no idea if anyone is listening, right? <laughs> and you're just like speaking into the void. And so that when you when that first comment comes in, when that first tweet comes in, when that first email from the website comes in, you know, you, you jump all over it. And I still, you know, I between my guests and the the listeners that comment, you know, I, I really hold those in high regard because I think, um, you know, you just build a, a loyal tribe of, of listeners who are drawn to, you know, you, your show, it's the combination of the guests you have and and your personality that, that they like. And the guy, the fact that the guy said he's, he's painting, you know, while he's listening to your show is pretty inspiring. 
Yeah, and I've become friendly with some people who listen to the show, you know, who say, hey, I really love your show. And then I end up meeting them. And, you know, I've done studio visits with some of them, you know. I do, what, what kind of relationships have you had post, I mean, with your, with your listeners, if you don't mind me asking? Well, I mean, I've, I've, I, I make it a point to go to, to conferences. So I go to podcasting conferences and, you know, I meet some of the listeners in person. And I, I usually have uh, T-shirts with me. I, I, I take a picture with them. I give them a free T-shirt and, right. you know, just thank them profusely because, you know, it is sometimes it's, it's very humbling, like, to see, you know, to meet someone. It's like, oh, I, one guy went and listened to my whole back catalog. And yeah, I was blown away. I was like, "Wow, thank you!" Like, <laughs> yeah, the fact that you'd want to go ahead and do that. And then you know, it's a, it's podcasters in nature. You know, sort of com- completists and like I, I do that as well. If I find a show that I really like, I say, "Okay, I want to hear the story here." You know, I want right. to hear how he got started. And right. it gets harder and harder with so many great shows coming on board, though. Have uh, you seen anybody wearing your the t shirt for your show? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's got to be a humbling experience. Well, yeah, it's with. Well, I took a bunch. I took fifty to the last conference because I wanted to give first of all to my guests, my previous guests. They were going to be there since mm-hmm. I speak to podcasters. Obviously, mm-hmm. a lot of podcasters are going to be there. And then I was just giving away shirts, and they said, "You know, how much? How much of the shirts?" I, I said, "They're they're either ten dollars or they're free. Which one would you want?" And they said, "Well, uh, with their puzzled look on the face, they said, I'll take the free one." I was like, oh, "Okay, all you have to do is subscribe." to the show right in front of me <laughs> so i get an instant subscriber hopefully they stayed listening but you know right like to your p- earlier point about being ruthless and asking for uh donations yeah. you know i i think sometimes as podcasters we're just afraid to ask but i wonder if for you there's a there's a parallel in this idea of artists you know this 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 taboo top you know subject of not not asking for money for your work and then if if you do then it's not really art i'm sure you've engaged with a lot of those types of conversations with fellow artists no actually uh, it's a very market friendly era that we're living in you'd be it's almost the opposite you'd be surprised um, by the way i remember one of my episodes uh, <clears throat> with a guy named carl handel who has been a uh, co-host and guest on the show. Uh, but I remember cause I deluded myself into thinking his episode was going to be one of those episodes that really got a lot of hits. Um, and I remember saying in the intro to that episode, um, you know, just because it's free doesn't mean it's not valuable. Exactly. <laughs> so that's really, I mean, so on one hand, I think that I, so basically another way of answering your question is I think podcast content is undervalued and I think art tends to be, especially market successful art tends to be overvalued. Mm. Yeah. So no, you will not hear Harry, you will not hear people saying, you know, anybody that I've ever met who's an artist say, you know, um, I'm not interested in selling this, um, because, uh, that would be cynical. At the end of the day, you want to get paid for the work that you do and, you know, absolutely. So, I mean, that's why artists who don't sell much work, you know, ultimately became, become forms of hoarders, you know. I mean, they're holding mm. on to their work with the thought that, you know, this is my back catalog. I've got to <laughs> haul it around with me. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I heard a photographer, uh, I, the guest on my the previous episode was, um, he was at the conference, he was at the meetup with us, Ibarrio mm. Nex Perello. Oh, Okay. And uh, he's he's had a his show's called the Candid Frame. Uh, he's been doing it for ten years. Wow! He had a guest on who talked about wanting to be like he wants. He said something to the effect of like he wants his art to be like purchased, and he just doesn't want it sitting in some like dark room where no one's ever going to see it. He's like the the reason I create the art is because I want someone to you know buy it and be proud of it, and you know it people to know who I am and as a result right. of it, you know, not just sitting in some, I don't know, hidden room storage or, or facility. some storage facility or some, right. yeah, or some collection right. somewhere. Gathering. Well, I would ask him, I would ask this artist, I would say, well, would you rather hold on to that given work or a given set of works in your studio to potentially be seen by visitors or would you rather sell that work and then have it wind up in a storage facility. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the lesser of two evils. I That's suppose. true. Yeah. Do you have an, um, a relationship with a with a past or current mentor who's had an impact on your life? Oh, that's a good one. Um, 
Well, you're a mentor of sorts, and I thank you for that. You are a mentor to this podcast, and I thank you for that. Um, not enough, honestly. Honestly, not enough. Uh, actually, I, um, I've spent far too little time with Deb Cloud Mann, who's been my most frequent co-host for the show. Um, and we're going to be getting together soon and chatting uh, finally, sort of in a bigger picture way, as opposed to just recording an episode. So um, I consider her a <clears throat> an important colleague. And other than that, you know, I am one of these nomad type artists, uh, very different from what you often get in Los Angeles, which is the tribe artists. And, and when I say tribe, I mean associated with a school. Right. So if like the as USC is to film school, you know, UCLA and Cal Arts and Art Center, these are all tribes, you know, and these artists who come out of the MFA programs, the master's programs, you know, become these tribes that wander around L.A. together. I went to grad school in New York. Okay. I don't have any current connections with any of the people I went to grad school with out here in L.A. And so the mentors that I had maybe from that time, you know, are either dead or on the East coast. Uh, when did you, when did you uh, leave New York? Cause I've, I've been here now two years and was in the East village prior to that. I left New York September 1st, 2001. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Hauling my four bags of luggage all by myself through the lobby of the airport into the checkout counter. Never again would it be like that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You must have, uh, 10 days later, the world changed. Yeah. I mean, you know, people have asked, the most recent question when they found out that I, that's when I left was, you know, did you feel like you wanted to be a part of it? You know, like guilty that you weren't. I, d I didn't feel guilty that I wasn't part of it. I felt a weird sort of combination of luck and uh, melancholy, I yeah. think. You know, I left actually to Atlanta for something I had committed to uh, a month later in, in October. And I actually did feel a bit of like uh, melancholy and like I was abandoning the city. And, you know, it's, it's weird in its time of need because I, I, I was there. I was in East Village. So I was wow. I could see the towers from my window in my wow. in my apartment. Um, what street were you on, Harry? Uh, uh, eight, seventh, seventh and A. Seventh and A. Wow. Yeah, seven. Tompkins Square Park. Yeah, exactly. Right there. Okay. One of my, um, I, I hope I don't regret giving him a shout out, but one of my, in the past, favorite artists, a guy named Ashley Bickerton, um, who art people will recognize the name of, um, he had a, he lived in an apartment, I think on seventh between A and B for many years. So you were right down the street. What's your fondest memory of uh, New York City? Ooh, uh, I guess I'm going to have to, the first one that comes to mind is a pretty corny one, but I lived in many different neighborhoods. One of them was the Upper West Side. And I remember leaving a party at a friend's house on the Upper East Side and it, it was snowing or it just snowed and I was walking across Central Park and it was all pretty, you know, because of the snow. And I didn't, you know, this was before cell phones. I, if I had one, I would have called him and said, it's so great out. But instead, I left him a message on his answering machine of essentially the same thing. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. What, uh, what have you changed your mind about recently? Huh. Uh, I, I actually, I'm, I'm going to vote for Donald. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I've had it with this progressive thing. <laughs> um, uh that's a great, that's a really tough and great question. And I'm sure nothing will come to mind unless I do a little bit of work, but let me see if I can figure anything out. Um, Ooh, what have I changed my mind about? Uh, going back and forth between whether there's going to be estrangement or whether there's hope. So I don't know if that is a really a good way of answering your question, but, um, that's something I've been changing my mind about to some extent. How long have you been thinking about that issue? Well, it's been going on for about three weeks. So, yeah. And which way are you leaning? Oh, boy. I, I, it feels like the beginning of the end still. 
that's kind of where I started. And then I kind of maybe went through a hopeful period and now I'm kind of back at the beginning at the end. So yeah, that's where I'm leaning right now, unfortunately. Interesting. What's, yeah. what's, um, what's the one most misunderstood thing about you? Hmm. Interesting. Um, thank you for asking that. Uh, what is the most misunderstood thing about me? Wow. God, I could so, go so many different places <laughs> with that. Um, go with your impulse. Yeah. Well, I had this really weird experience where in which I was at a party and I was talking to this young woman and artist and <clears throat> She started, she and I started talking and she said, I think a mutual friend or acquaintance came up and she said, oh, I recognize your voice. And then she made the connection. She recognized that I was from the podcast because her studio mate had been on the show. And we went on to have a quite a long conversation. And at the end of it, she kind of almost berated me or kind of made fun of me for being such a good listener. And so... I guess if if I'm misunderstood as being too good a listener, as only a listener, I want to be able to be understood also as somebody who can talk as well. That's interesting. Do you ever feel like, you know, oh, Harry, he's a really good listener? You know, does that ever grate on you? No, I mean, as opposed to... Harry, he won't shut the F up. <laughs> right, yeah. If, if, if those are the choices... Yeah. So with with the with all the time that you spent on on the podcast and and you know the ups and downs what do you think are going to be um the challenges for you specifically as as you think about the the upcoming year and and re, as it relates to your show? Right. <clears throat> well, the first question uh, first of all I'm going to answer one of your earlier questions as, as at the same time as I answered this one and that is that I I started working with another intern recently. So yeah. there is hope. Yeah. That, you know, cuz that's a really concrete way to actually make progress, you know, when you have more hands on deck. But I I can tell you a very recent challenge which I think is going to come into play as as things go goes on because you and I'm going to give you credit here encourage me to put out one episode a week, you know, for the sake of the listener, for the sake of continuity, for the sake of, um, you know, growth. Um, in the course of, you know, going to UNLV for this presentation last week and kind of just hitting a little bit of mild burnout, you know, I, I didn't put out an episode last weekend. So I think that's really going to be the ongoing challenge. Can I really sustain all this booking, all this prepping, all these recordings, all this editing, all this releasing week after week after week when the growth, I mean, and this was the thing that I rationalized about not putting out this episode last weekend. I didn't feel like I was feeling enough of a bump from putting out one a week versus one every other week. So that is going to be a big ongoing challenge. How, how can I continue that pace when I don't really feel like or see any return on that investment? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's, it has to come down to what uh, you're passionate about or what you're motivated to do in a way where it doesn't start to feel like a grind. Right. Because when that starts to happen, you lose enthusiasm enthusiasm for, for doing this, um, you know, week in, week out or, or biweekly. And, you know, you'll, you'll get burned out. I think it's it's a really interesting tightrope between that burnout and kind of an intellectual and social titillation that you know that comes with the the arc of you know dealing with a a guest you know yeah. I don't when I say deal with I don't necessarily mean that in a in a uh, derogatory right. sense yeah exactly but um, but there are those moments, certainly. I mean, usually the way it goes, and, and I would love to hear your thought on this too, is, you know, there's, you kind of go from meet cute, <laughs> that's a horrible analogy. You go from, you know, the initial contact to um, leading up to the moment, which is the recording, to kind of a wind down. And sometimes that wind down is awfully abrupt, you know, and, and people bail. 
You know, like I depend on my guests for referrals. Mm. So if they bail on me, they are shirking their duties as guests to the show. What, think, what's your experience in that regard? Well, I, I, th- I mean, I, I don't like to give my put that sort of responsibility on my guests because the fact that they agreed to come on my show for me is right. like short, sort of like where it ends. And right. I, I think it's my job to put them in the best light possible. And, and then just, I just look to continue to, you know, pay it back wherever I can. I'm always keep, I, I keep a, a specific Twitter list. I just add them to this Twitter list called previous guests or a powerful podcast junkies. I called it. Right. Um, and I just keep tabs every once in a while, look in what they're doing. And if I can, you know, engage with them online, just sort of anything I can do to keep, keep the connection there. And I think when you do that, I think naturally things tend to happen or manifest. And I've got friends that I literally have new friends that, that have come about as a result of podcasting, which is crazy because pe- right. these, these are people that I didn't even know existed two years ago. <laughs> right. So, I, I, I think the takeaway from what you're saying here is that I'm being way too much of a taskmaster. <laughs> th- with my guests, I th- yeah, I think you should let the pendulum swing the other way for a little bit, and just right. come, just come, up from, just come from a place of uh, genuine, um, you know, giving and yeah. and just yeah. want to, wanting to help and wanting to put them in the best light possible. Don't give them homework. <laughs> Don't give them, you know, feeling like they got to leave and get you five names, or else you'll never right. talk to them again. I think uh, you know, just try a different, just a different tactic. You know. Try it and see how it works, and just literally. But it's working, Harry. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's it, working getting them to give me names. It's working. Well, it, I, it all depends on how you ask them, right? <laughs> oh yeah, no, I think I ask them p- politely. Yeah. I, I don't think I laid, you know, say if you, you know, I'm going to cut your show. <laughs> Although I've been tempted to, believe me. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I there was a question I had in there, but I, but I, but I lost it. Um, yeah, I, yeah, it was, it was the part about being generous, you yeah. know, and, and, and giving. Um, and this is actually raises a question for me, which I, I would love to know your thought on. Um, one of the challenge, biggest challenges I had early on that I, I really had to sort of reframe the approach to the podcast with was I felt at a certain point like I was a tool that was promoting my these artists that I had on the show. Like this was an opportunity for a clip for them, like mm-hmm. a, or a PR addition to their PR portfolio. You know what I mean? I don't feel like that as much now, but it's something that I'm navigating. You know what I mean? Um, and I, I wonder now that I'm saying this, if I now can't share this with anybody that actually listens to the show, but, um, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I guess I, you know, if I'm going to be honest about something, I, I feel much more comfortable being honest about that than some of my, you know, the skeletons in my closet. <laughs> Sounds like we'd need a second hour just to get through yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or, or another, yeah. Um, well, Michael, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, chat a bit about the, the, the challenges you're having with your show, and, and, and I think they're, they're no different than what a lot of podcasters go through, so it's nice to, to, to have people listen in and commiserate. My pleasure, Harry. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, yeah, you're a good interview. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Thank you. So what's the <laughs> best place for folks to track you down? theconversationpod.com or uh, email theconversationartpodcast at gmail.com at artistpodcast on Twitter and Instagram. All right. Thanks. And uh, if you have any interest in uh, the art world and uh, some behind the scenes conversations that I highly recommend you check uh, Michael's show out, hopefully you'll get a little bit of bump or some new listeners find the show. That would be awesome, Harry. That would be awesome. (laughs) All right. Have a good night. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Michael. I Thanks to him for taking the time to meet with me, and I'm glad he was able to to, to get a little personal about some of the challenges he had um, as a solo host, as someone who's looking for ways to monetize the podcast, and his interest in going deeper with his guests, which is something that I think all podcasters can relate to. And I want to thank you for stopping by. I, I was reminded of a comment by Ibarionex from uh, last week uh, where he said that the listener makes a big difference to the show. And so to that point, um, just take the time today to 
support a podcast that you love. It doesn't have to be this one, but I think if you if if this show can serve as a weekly reminder to sort of pay it forward for those shows that are providing value for you, then I won't get tired of saying it because I think if you're a podcast junkie, like I know you are, and if you're listening to the show, you definitely are, then my show is definitely not the only one in the queue. So go out of your way to send an email, respond back to a tweet, uh, like them on Facebook, make a comment in a forum somewhere, obviously a rating and review, and do that and you'll make a podcaster's day, I guarantee it. So podcast, 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 podcast junkies, that's probably something else. Podcast junkies is a proud member of Podcastica with two new shows under uh, its, its umbrella. Um, if you didn't hear the announcement last week, we're super proud to welcome uh, Ron Dawson from uh, Radio Film School. And the other new podcast is the One Mind Podcast with Morgan Dix. Don't forget, rounding out the roster is the Evil Dead cast, Once Upon a Podcast, Game of Microphones, which is going to get exciting as the new season kicks in, Sci-Fi Movie Podcast, Under the Comic Covers, uh, Podcast Junkies, of course, and uh, our anchor show, The Walking Dead cast with Jason Kabasi, which has been my therapy session after each week of Walking Dead. The season is bananas. So uh, we're excited that the family's growing. I invite you to head on over to podcastica.com. And uh, we have another show that's being planned. That's my reminder to drink water. It's called Waterminder. You should give it a shot. It's an iOS app. Um, but I digress. <laughs> so yeah, we've got another show we're in conversations with. So hopefully we'll be making an announcement about that shortly. Uh, intro and outro music composed by Cedar and Soil. Check them out at cedarsoil.com. And um, don't forget that uh, we're support, we are sponsored by Fancy Hands this episode. So if you want to be considered for the monthly drawing uh, for the, for the uh, codes for the five free tasks on Fancy Hands, then leave us a, a review on iTunes or on Stitcher and we'll track those down and find you. All you have to do is put the hashtag Fancy Hands. And if you made it this far, you're in for a treat. You get a shiny new retention hashtag. This week it's going to be cyanotype. That's a mouthful, but it's the type of art that uh, Michael works on. And it's uh, spelled C-Y-A-N-O-T-Y-P-E, hashtag cyanotype. If you made it this far, um, tag myself and tag uh, podcast underscore junkies and also uh, tag Michael as well. So I'm going to take a quick look here because I should have this stuff ready, but I never do. So bear with me as I look in here. <laughs> And uh, there we go. So uh, Michael's Twitter is Artist Podcast. Artist Podcast, one word. Tag us both and let us know that you made it this far. We most definitely appreciate it. Have a fantastic week. Take care, guys. Mm -hmm.